This morning, as I've already mentioned, we're going to be looking at the second commandment. Last week was in the morning an introduction to um, what we've been looking at, and I'll review that a little bit in the uh, introduction to this particular commandment. But we also saw the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Uh, now we're looking at the second commandment, which we read in Exodus 20, uh, verses 4 through 6. He says, you shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now again, we're going to look at what difference the new covenant makes with regard to those motivations in particular that we see embedded in this commandment. We need to understand the standard is the same, but the motive is different. That's what we labored last week. We now have the motive of love, so we don't have to be terrorized in order to do it, although there are instances where Perhaps when love is growing weak, we need that incentive. The fear of the Lord for the Christian is always good. We need to fear Him. We need to re respect Him. We need to revere Him. But most of all, we need to love Him. And certainly that shouldn't be difficult for us to do with the Spirit of God in us. Seeing Him as He is, especially as He declares His love and His grace and His mercy to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Enough mercy and love to cover all of our sins. Well, again, by way of review, so far we've seen that when God brought His people out of Egypt, He made a covenant with them, the Mosaic Covenant. And in that covenant, He took His law, His holy standard, and He gave it to them, written, as we've already seen, on two stone tablets. And that standard, that law, was meant to show them how to live and perhaps more specifically, how to love. But it was also meant to show them that they didn't have the power to love. It was meant to drive them, as it were, or at least to point them to the one that God had promised them in the Abrahamic covenant, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who hadn't come yet, but the one who was promised, the Messiah that they were looking forward to, who alone could give them the power they needed to obey. That's what the New Covenant Jeremiah was talking about, which is what we looked at last week, quoted by the author to the Hebrews. Now again, here's perhaps a good opportunity to consider how the law works. When you're outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, it warns you of what your sins deserve. It, it in a certain sense, convicts you. It actually does convict you and makes you afraid so that it'll drive you to the Lord Jesus Christ so that you might be saved by His grace. But once you come to Christ, Jesus points you back to the law and He says, this is how I want you to live. Now, if you're in the new covenant, that's where you're at, you see. This is how I want you to live. If you're outside of Christ, the law threatens judgment to drive you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the Old Covenant, we might say, was given to a group of people who were redeemed and yet not redeemed. They are redeemed in a certain sense. I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, the idea here is that God gave them this law in order to um, show them their sins and their need of the Lord Jesus Christ. But most of them didn't look to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they did not receive the power to obey the Lord, and so they did not keep God's covenant. Now in the new covenant, we saw God fix the problem. And the problem wasn't with the standard. The problem was not with the law. The standard was sound. The apostle Paul tells us in Romans seven twelve that the law is holy, the law is righteous, and the law is good. And he said, did, is, did that which is good become a source of sin for me? No, it wasn't the law. That wasn't the problem. The problem is with me. The problem is I did not love the law. And that's exactly what the author to the Hebrews was saying or what Jeremiah was saying. 
regarding the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The problem was with the people. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 8 verse 9, they did not continue in my covenant and I did not care for them, says the Lord. Now in the New Covenant, God put His law in our minds and He wrote them on our hearts. He did this by sending Jesus, the seed that he had promised Abraham. Just as the Lord had delivered his old covenant people from their slavery in Egypt through Moses, he delivered us from our slavery to sin through Jesus. Now we noted that Jesus did two things through his death. He delivered us from our guilt. If we have trusted him, we no longer need to fear judgment. We are delivered. We're saved. But he also delivered us from the power of sin. He gave to us his spirit so that we might obey him from the heart, that we might become, as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, the servants of righteousness. But what does righteousness look like? Did the Lord really leave it up to us? Did He leave us on our own to try to figure out how we are to obey Him? Are we to do whatever we feel is the right thing to do? Are we to look to the world and do what they do? No. The Lord has actually been showing us from the very beginning in that law that He wrote on the hearts of our first parents, Adam and Eve. He may not have given it to them in a written standard, but he did write it upon their hearts. They had the knowledge of what was pleasing to him and they had the power to obey him. Now sadly, they lost that for themselves and for all of us when they fell in the garden. But this was the same law, the same standard that he wrote on the tablets of stone, as we've already noted, and now in the new covenant, as again Jeremiah says and as the author to the Hebrews says, it's the same law he writes on our hearts now, the Lord knows how liable we are to be led astray by the environment that we're in, by the world and by our flesh. And so he tells us clearly in his word what we are to do, and he gives us his spirit to teach us and to lead us and actually give us the desire to go that direction. That's what it means to walk in the spirit. It doesn't mean to just sort of analyze subjectively what I feel like doing in this situation or that situation, but rather the Spirit of God bears witness to the Word of God and He tells us this is the way. Walk in it. Now very simply put, the right thing to do, what it is the Lord is calling us to do is what, is what Jesus did. Jesus was filled with the Spirit of God. Jesus had His Father's law written on His heart. He loved His Father perfectly and so he becomes to us the perfect example of how we are to live now as we go through these commandments we're going to see that this is exactly how Jesus lived I mean first of all Jesus gave himself wholly to God he devoted himself completely to him he took the true God to be his God and he loved him more than any other he trusted him and he relied on him to meet his needs, to deliver him from danger, and to keep him to the end. In other words, Jesus fulfilled the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Now that is what we are to do. Take God as our God, trust in him, rely upon him, worship him, devote ourselves to him, love him most of all, just as Jesus did. And remember, he gave us the power to do this by His Holy Spirit. That's what we want to do. It's like preaching to the choir, right? We already have this desire. And so the Lord is telling us to do what He wants us to do. Same thing Augustine was referring to when he said, Lord, command what you will and then give what you command. Well, He's already given us what He's commanded. So when He commands us, we should say, Lord, I submit to that. I, I want to do that. I want to please you because it's in my heart to do it because it's right, because you've loved me and given me your son, because Jesus did it. We have all these reasons. Now this morning we see something else Jesus did. He gave himself to worship the Father 
with his whole heart and life. And here is something else that we're to follow. And we can follow it because of his grace. I want us to look at three things this morning. First of all, the principle that's contained in the second commandment, our whole life is to be a continual act of love to God. Secondly, the reason he calls us to do this, his jealous love for us, he is jealous over us with a godly jealousy. And then thirdly, the motive that he holds out to further enforce this that we might keep it, which is his promise to bless us. Now, first of all, and by the way, this first point is going to be the longest point. The last two will be relatively short. Let's consider the principle. Our whole life is to be a continual act of love to God. He says in verses 4 and 5, You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. Now, the principle that I mentioned before may not be immediately apparent from this commandment, but again, hopefully we'll see it as we think through this commandment. Now, first of all, God here is clearly forbidding idolatry. I think we would all agree with that. We really can't love Him the way He calls us to with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength if we love other gods. Remember what he said in the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, which means none beside me, none in front of me, none competing with me, none above me. We need to have him and him alone as our God. Nothing else must be even a close second. Even among those we love the most in this world, we need to love God most of all. Jesus said to those who are following him, unless you hate father and mother, and brothers and sisters and your possessions and your life, you cannot be my disciple. And he didn't mean by that literally hate them, but in comparison to our love for him. But on the other hand, this isn't merely a repetition of the first commandment. He's already told us not to have other gods, so is he telling us again, this, in this case, idols too. Well, no, he's actually telling us something more. He's also telling us that he doesn't want us to worship him through images. Now, let, let's think about what that means for just a moment. I mean, how could we even do such a thing? How would it even be possible to do this? God is a spirit. And contrary to what a lot of people believe, even Christians, a spirit is formless. God doesn't look like, like this, you see. He doesn't look like a human being, even though he does represent himself sometimes in Scripture as having hands and so forth, he also represents himself as having wings. Do we then believe God is a winged man? No, it's just that he's using these as images to describe something about himself in terms we can understand. We call it anthropomorphism in the form of a man so that we can relate to him. But God is an infinite spirit. He doesn't have shape and form. He says through Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 40, verse 18, to whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? In other words, there is none that you can use. He doesn't have a form. So the implied answer is no, there is none. So when the Israelites actually broke this commandment, as I already told you earlier, and they made an image of God, what image did they make God into? What form did they use? Well, they used the image of a calf, <laughs> a golden calf. And as I told you before, it's clear in this, this action they did, this making of this calf, that they meant to worship the true God through it, the God who had just delivered them from Egypt. When Aaron saw it, he built an altar to the Lord and he proclaimed that the next day they would hold a feast to Yahweh and they used God's covenant name. And then later on when they presented the, the idol to Israel, they said, Behold, O Israel, your God who brought you out of Egypt. And they used the word Elohim, which is the plural of, of the word God in Hebrew, which is how God refers to himself. Now, what were they actually doing here? They were dragging God, the infinite, eternal, unchangeable God, down to the level of a creature. 
How would you feel if somebody drew a picture of an amoeba and they said, this is you, you know? Well, we'd be offended by that, wouldn't we? Because the, we would consider the amoeba to be beneath our dignity, as it were. Well, what about when you take and you, you, you make an image of God in, a, in, a, in the form of a finite creature and you say, this is the infinite and eternal and unchangeable God? How would God feel about that? They didn't even use the image that He created. I mean, we are made in the image of God, but again, not physically, but spiritually in our ability to think, in our ability to be aware of our existence, to have purpose, to have morality. These are the ways in which we image God. They didn't even use God's image that he made, they, and although he would have forbidden that as well, but they used an animal. Now, how did God, what did God think about that? Well, I think we know by the way he responded to it. There were many people actually who were destroyed in his wrath. But there's more here than the fact that God doesn't want us to worship Him through images, whether those images happen to be graven images, cast images, three-dimensional, two-dimensional, or even images in our mind. What He's telling us is that He doesn't want us to worship Him in any other way than what He has specifically told us. Now, He mentions this particular application, I think, of the principle because this is the way that his people would have been tempted to worship him um, because they were going to be going into that land where people worship their gods in that way. This is the way the people of the land worshiped their gods. And since we all have the tendency to be affected by the people around us, the Lord was heading off that particular sin that they were going to commit against him, and he specifies that particular than infraction of the commandment. The principle is that he wants us to worship him in the way that he tells us, not in any way that we might want to do it. And who better to tell us how he wants to be worshiped than God himself? And as a matter of fact, he does tell us how he wants to be worshiped. Now this principle, as I've said, applies to the worship that we give to the Lord in a narrow sense, that is, how we are to conduct ourselves when we do what we normally think of as worship. When we gather together like we are gathered together today to worship Him, how do we do it? Well, we do it in the way He's called us to. When we get alone by ourselves and we want to spend time with the Lord and we want to express our love and devotion to Him, how do we do it? Well, we do it in the way that He has shown us, what He commands, and what he has shown us by way of example. Now, we don't have time to go into this in detail, but let me just tell you generally what he tells us to do. That we are to gather on the first day of the week. We have a common day off where we're all called to rest so that we can gather and worship and spend the day with him. When we gather together, his word is to be read and preached, and we are to listen to that and learn from it and be encouraged and exhorted. We are to pray together. We are to sing hymns and psalms together and, of course, share in His Supper. On occasion, we are to witness or participate in baptism. We are to fast when we're seeking the Lord for some mercy, or sometimes we may even take oaths or make vows, such as when people become members of this particular church. Now, I think it's important that we understand this principle because of the way that the church is going today. There's still some regard for what the Lord says in His Word, but there is such a strong temptation for church leaders to compromise what God says to do in order to build bigger churches. And I think that they have found that there is a relationship between lowering the standard and making more people feel comfortable. I think the more you lower it, the more people feel comfortable and the more people come in. The more you're innovative, the more you focus on what it is that people like rather than on what God likes, it tends to build bigger churches. And obviously the temptation to want to have a big church will lead them in this direction. But we also need to understand the, the lower we put the standard, the less the Lord is going to be blessed by what we're doing and the less He will bless them because this isn't what He wants. Now if we measured blessing by numbers, we would say, they're doing the right thing. But if we measure it by our love for the Lord, 
You see, that's how we really need to measure it. Then we would see if we do the things the Lord wants to, He's going to be more present with us and He is going to bless us. So if we want to show the Lord that we love Him in our worship, we need to do things the way that He has told us to do it. Now, this also applies to our worship in a broader sense, and this is where we get to the theme that we're looking at. It tells us that if we are to love God, we must live as He wants us to live because all of life is worship to the Lord. Paul writes in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is, note, your spiritual service of worship. What is worshiping the Lord? But by presenting yourselves to the Lord, presenting the members of your body as instruments of righteousness, not just on the Lord's day, but every single day of your life, every moment of your life. And notice what follows. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul is telling us that our whole lives are to be a continual act of worship to the Lord, and if they are to be an act of worship to Him, they have to be framed by the Word of God. Now again, we're going to see how this works itself out in the next several commandments. But let's consider what this commandment calls us to do specifically for just a few moments. It says God wants us to live in a particular way. He wants us to see things the way that He sees them. I think we all recognize that people see things differently. I mean, just look at the elections we just went through. I think you'll see people see things differently. People call things we call evil. They call it good. And things that they would call good, we would call evil. We see things differently. How are we supposed to see them? We're supposed to see them not as man sees them, not as the majority sees them, but we are to see them as God sees them. And how are we to do things? Well, we are to do them as the Lord tells us to do them. The reason is basically the same as why he forbade his people to worship him through images. He doesn't want us to follow the example of the people of the world who do not know him, who do not love him. He wants us to follow the example that he has given to us. That, that really doesn't need to be labor, does it? That seems to be fairly plain. We need to remember, too, that we were born into a world that is in rebellion against God. Who is the God of this world? Well, ultimately God is because He's the one who created, He's in control. But Paul reminds us that the God of this world is really Satan and the people of this world walk according to that God and not the God of the Bible. The people of the world follow Him. And when we were born into this world, we also followed Him. I mean, Paul even says of himself, we all formerly walked according to the desires of the flesh, according to the prince of the power of this world, we were blind to the things of the Lord. And so in that condition, we drew our values from this world. And this is true of us even if we happen to have been raised in Christian households that taught us differently. All of us have imbibed at least some of the world's values. Now, the Lord is telling us in this commandment and through the example of our Lord Jesus Christ who lived according to this commandment perfectly, if we are to love Him, we have to put those worldly values away. And we need to learn to see things and do things the way the Lord tells us to. Again, I'll remind you, Paul says in Romans 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So do you want to please Him? Then you need to change the way you think, if it's contrary to the Word of God, by renewing your mind. And how do you do that? You study the Word of God. You change the way you live 
by living according to the standard. You learn what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect in his eyes through his law, which is holy and righteous and good. And you set your heart to do that. Now I ask you, did Jesus do that? Yeah, Jesus did that. That's what his whole life was about. Does he call us to follow him? Did he come into this world in order to uh, make us like him? In order to give us his spirit so that we could? That is what he wants us to do. This is how he wants us to live. This is why he came into the world, so that we would be able to do this, so he wouldn't remain the slaves of sin, but we would become the servants of righteousness, as well as to forgive us, so that we wouldn't be in danger any longer of judgment. Now, as I said, that was the first point. It was the longest point, but there's two more points. Why should we want to do this? Well, we should do it because he loves us. I mean, he gave us a son that we might be forgiven, that we might be free, so that we might walk with him in newness of life. That was a tremendous act of love. And that love calls us to love him in return. But he also gives us other reasons, two further reasons in this command. And the first one is because God is a jealous God. Because, because God loves us with a jealous love. He says in verse 5, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. God is jealous over us. That's why he forbids idolatry. That's why he forbids us to go after other gods, for one thing. I mean, how does it feel when somebody you love rejects you and runs after somebody else? Well, this is what God tells us that he experiences at least in some way when we turn from him to other gods. I mean, after all, we are his spouse. We are the bride of his son. We belong to him. And of course, since we do, he would never allow us to go entirely away, but he will hold on to us and he will keep us uh, from doing anything that would ultimately destroy us because he loves us, because he, well, so anyway, the idea of his love is he is jealous over us, but he is also jealous for his holy ways. When we do things that he would have us not to do, those things are offensive to him. And because he loves us so much, he will do what is necessary to get us to turn away from those things and to walk again in the path of blessing. Now, it didn't work out exactly the same way in the Old Covenant. But if you're in the new covenant, that's how it works out because the Lord is not going to let go of you if you have trusted him, if you've trusted Jesus, if you've received his righteousness, been made new creatures and are united to Jesus and his spouse, he'll never let go of you. So that is the way it works out in the new covenant. But now finally, he gives us one more motivation and that is blessing if we obey. And by the way, there are two motivations here, so we, we need to look at both of them briefly. He actually tells us what will happen if we go one or the other direction. Now, what if we should decide not to obey him and to worship him any way we want to or not to have him as our God or, you know, to go after other gods? What, what's going to happen? Well, first of all, if we don't obey the Lord, it can be for one of two reasons. Either we've lapsed, temporarily fallen into sin, in which case what's going to happen? The Lord, by His grace, will lead us to repentance. He may discipline us, so He won't let us go. But the other possibility of why we would break this commandment, and which is recognized here, is because we don't love Him. We might break this commandment because we really don't love Him. And if we don't love him, and I mean absolutely love him, then we really don't know him. And if we don't know him, notice that there are consequences. Consequences to us and consequences to our children. Look at what he says in verse 5. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. 
Now, if you don't love God, then what do you do? Well, you, you hate Him. There's, you can only do one or the other. You can't love Him a little and hate Him a little and so forth. It's, so, what happens if you hate Him? Well, you're unconverted. That means consequences for you, but it means consequences for your posterity. God doesn't deal just with us. He deals with generations to come, okay? Now, what is He saying here? He's not saying that He's going to punish the children of those who hate Him for the sins that those who hate Him have committed, but He's going to punish them for the sins that they have committed against Him. But the consequences of our sins, or the ones who hate Him, I shouldn't say our sins, but of those who hate Him, will be the withholding of His grace from their children, and their children's children, and their children, and possibly their children. That's the third and the fourth generations. Now, that is the rule, though there are certainly exceptions that God gives by His grace. And we need to see this. We need to understand this. God does not owe His mercy to anyone, His saving mercy. He, he's, God is merciful, and His mercies are over all of His works. We read psalm after psalm and statement after statement in Scripture that God is good and He does good to all, and that is a mercy on God's part to do that. But this kind of mercy we're talking about is saving mercy, and God does not owe saving mercy to anyone. Whenever God saves, He does it purely by His grace. Now, there are reasons in Scripture, sometimes we don't understand this, but there are reasons that He chooses not to have mercy on some that are in those He chooses not to have mercy on. Now, when He chooses to have mercy on some, it's never in them. It's purely of His, of his good grace. But when He chooses not to have mercy, it is because of what they are doing. And what He's saying here is that if, if we provoke Him, if we hate Him and we refuse to serve Him and to honor Him in this way, that it'll have consequences for us, but also it will influence whether He will have mercy on the generations that come from us. I mean, look at what happened in the Old Testament to the children of Ham because of what He did to Noah. Uh, his descendants are the Philistines. His, his descendants are the Egyptians. They're the, the Canaanites. They're the ones that are being destroyed in the Old Testament. So Ham's decision to do what he did had consequences for himself and for his children. Remember what the name of Ham's son was? And when Noah saw what Ham had did, what did he say? Cursed be Ham? He said, no, cursed be Canaan. Canaan, the son of Ham. Well, what, what did Canaan have to do with it? He wasn't the one who did it. It was Ham. Well, it's because Ham hated him, and it had consequences on his children. So the warning here is simply this, the idea that God would turn away his mercy upon our posterity because we hated him. You see, that, that can happen. To know that you were the cause of his turning away and of showing mercy from your children. That's something you don't want to happen. So I say that simply by way of warning, and that's why the Lord gives it this morning. If you don't love Him, if you're not following Him, turn from your sins and receive His mercy and His grace, which He freely offers to you this morning in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you turn to Him as your Savior and you submit to Him, completely surrender to Him as your Lord, you will not only gain blessing yourself, but potentially to your children. Now that brings us to the second possibility. What if you do this? What if you will love Him? What if you will serve Him and follow Him? What will He do for you? Well, look at what He says in verse 6. But showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now I know our first temptation here is to, is to think of this. Everybody who loves the Lord the Lord's going to show loving kindness to thousands, and we see it going off this way. But what he's talking about is the same thing he was talking about in the first part of it, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the third and fourth generations. We're, we're talking about the ones that come after me. He's talking about the same thing here, not thousands this way, thousands of people here all gathered together, but thousands of generations to follow. The Lord will show his mercy for a thousand generations. 
That is how gracious he is. Now, what does that mean? Is this an ironclad guarantee that all of our children are going to be saved if we will simply love the Lord and serve him? Well, I'd like to believe that, but we see in Scripture that isn't the case. We see that even the most godly people who follow the Lord had children that weren't converted. But it is a guarantee that he will visit our descendants in his mercy, and some of them will be saved purely by his grace. And who's the premier example of this in Scripture? Abraham. Abraham believed God, and God made a covenant with him and with his children. Did all of Abraham's descendants follow him? Well, he shows loving kindness to a thousand generations. Well, they didn't, even, they didn't go anywhere near a thousand generations. They should have all been saved, unless it means he's not going to save all of them necessarily. But did some of them get saved? Did God deal with them still as a whole? Did he reveal his word to them? Did he show them the way of salvation? Did he have them raised by godly parents? He did all of that for them. So he was a God to them, and they were his people, but he didn't save all of them. And even after the new covenant comes, God is still dealing graciously with Israel by showing mercy to them because of his love for their fathers. He's going to be merciful to a thousand generations. So he's still dealing with them, and again, purely by his grace. So not all of them are going to be saved, but there will be some who will be saved by his grace. By the way, it doesn't have to be just within the generations of those who actually loved him. God is saving, he's saving Egyptians. He's saving anybody that might be left over from those peoples that were under the curse in the old covenant. Uh, there's a lot of Gentiles who were in darkness. We were those, and he had mercy on us, and we didn't necessarily have godly parents. So God, as he reaches out to new people groups and so forth and brings them into his covenant, he still is saving people who never were connected to him. He's having tremendous mercy. Now the question is, do you want that blessing for your children? Because I'd rather, I'd rather be in the position of one loving the Lord and looking at his promise to the posterity rather than just hoping that he's going to save them out of the blue kind of thing out there in, in the darkness and so forth. You have a choice. I have a choice. Are we going to love him? Are we going to hate him? You know, which, which of the consequences do you want for yourself? Which of the consequences do you want for your children? Well, if you want this blessing, then you need to love him. You need to love him with all your heart. You need to love him with your whole life. You need to live the way he calls you to live, and he will grant you this blessing. Now, again, I would remind you, the only way you can do this is by the grace of God. God is not saying to us, here's a work you can do. If you do it, I'll bless you. If you don't do it, Forget it, you know, your consequences for you and your children. We can't look at this as a work we need to do in order to receive the blessing. He's not saying, do this and I will bless, but what he is saying is this, that through his son, he has already given us the power to love him and to serve him in this way. He has given us the power to obey. It's because of his son, Jesus, that we will receive this blessing and our obedience to this commandment is really merely the evidence that he has saved us through Jesus and his having saved us is what guarantees that we will obey and we will inherit the blessing. So it ultimately boils down to have you trusted Jesus and turned from your sins and do you have the evidence in your life that you have because you are turning from your sins, you are putting God first and you are living as he calls you to live. Do you love him? Are you following him? If you are, it's only because of Christ. It's not because you did that by your own power, but it's because he gave you the grace to do it. That's what the table reminds us of this morning. Again, is that Jesus' life and his death is the only reason we'll be saved, and it's the only way we can obey. It's the only reason why we would ever obey, because he has changed our hearts through his work through his giving us of his Holy Spirit. It's the evidence that his law is written on our hearts, the fact that we obey it because we want to obey it. So if we're obeying, it's because of his grace. And if we are obeying because of his grace, God will have mercy to a thousand generations. It's a tremendous blessing. And it's all because of what Jesus has done.
So let's take just a few moments because as we prepare to come to the table, ultimately the requirement for coming to the table is the same as the um, requirements or the stipulation, as it were, of how to inherit this blessing. We inherit this blessing by trusting in Jesus. He gives us the power to obey. In order to come to the table, we need to have trusted Jesus. We need to be turning from our sins. We need to be following him. Well, the qualifications for coming to the table are the same qualifications by which we inherit this blessing. So if that describes you, then the Lord calls you to come to his table and to remember why you're able to do this, to remember why his blessing is on you. It's because of what Jesus has done. It's not because of what we have done. He gives us the power to do it, and we do it, but we would never have done it except through his grace and his mercy. So he, we owe everything to him, and that's what the Lord wants us to remember. So if you love him in this way, if you are loving him and serving him in this way, the Lord calls you to come to the table this morning and to receive this, these emblems of his, of his death, essentially, and to know that this death was for you. He saved you from your sins. Remember to look to him as you come to the table. Well, let's, um, let's spend just a few moments in silent prayer and let's examine our hearts. Let's repent in, in any area where we see that we have not been following him. And let's prepare to come to the table to remember the source of our blessing.